Um, yeah, over there. And there's another one, yeah, there's another one on this side. I'm going to squeeze in as many as possible. So it's harder to hear when you're all the way at the back. We won't buy it, I promise. Um, thanks to those of you who are sitting on kids' chairs. As you know, this is our, this is the children's center. This is, I was just saying to Nicholas, this is almost as packed as it gets during story time. <laughs> so thank you all for being with us this evening. Uh, my name is Dina Chalaby. Uh, I'm one of the organizers of The Night Ideas, uh, and also um, and on, on behalf of SFMOMA. Uh, and um, I am also the founding co-curator of uh, Public Knowledge, which um, you might have heard Neil Benezra mention earlier this evening, is the partnership initiative between uh, the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art and the San Francisco Public Library. And we have been doing artist projects and public programming, um, publishing, and we've also had a temporary branch of the, muse of the public library at the museum for the last couple of years. And we've, all of our activity has been around two interrelated themes the changing city and knowledge in the digital age. And as you can imagine, it was very exciting to then, um, when the French consulate approached us to, to think about night of ideas and the city of the future, it seemed like a natural fit. So um, it's been great to partner with them on that. So, you know, thinking about the city of the future, I have a tendency to say that um, it's, it's good to look back, to look forward. And so in this session, um, we are going to do precisely that. Um, and think about how people in the past have reimagined, have imagined and reimagined the future of San Francisco and the Bay Area. So um, the genesis of this project, of this particular panel, is connected to uh, one of our public knowledge projects called Take Part, which um, is uh, around a model, a physical uh, wooden model, a thousand square foot model when it's all put together, of, um, uh, of San Francisco that was created between 1938 and 1940 um, by the Works Project Administration. And it has been brought back to San Francisco uh, by um, SFMOMA and SFPL um, at, the, um, at the imagining um, of uh, Bit van der Poel, who are an artist duo from the Netherlands, who are just flew in from Rotterdam um, to be with us this evening. So welcome, uh, you guys. Hopefully you'll have a chance to, to meet them later. And um, the project um, is really to, to use the model as a, as a forum and as a catalyst for conversation about the past, present, and future of San Francisco. And I think we'll hear a little bit about um, how models, both physical and uh, uh, mental, um, can you know, really fuel that, that conversation. So, um, and, and to also to think about publicness. So I'm really, really happy to have the three of you with us this evening. Thank you all so much for joining us. Um, I'm going to introduce our three speakers, and then each of them is going to speak for a few minutes about their work and about what, um, their, the, the, what particularly inspires them about this question of uh, um, how San Francisco has been imagined and reimagined, and then we'll, uh, we'll open up for some discussion. And I want to make sure that we have plenty of time for questions from all of you. Um, so I'm going to introduce them all together, and then we'll, we'll speak for a couple of minutes. So first, we're going to hear from Alison Eisenberg. Alison is professor of history at Princeton University, where she co-directs the Princeton Mellon Initiative in Architecture, Urbanism, and the Humanities. She is the author of Downtown America: A History of the Place and People Who Made It and Designing San Francisco, Art, Land, and Urban Renewal in the City by the Bay. Uh, next we'll hear from Gary Camilla, author of the best-selling book called Grey City of Love, 49 Views of San Francisco, and the history column Portals of the Past, which appears every other Saturday in the San Francisco Chronicle. He was co-founder and longtime executive editor of the groundbreaking website Salon.com, and is the former executive editor of San Francisco Magazine. Uh, last but not least, we will hear from Nicholas de Monchot, the Associate Professor of Architecture and Urban Design at UC Berkeley. He also serves as the Director for the Berkeley Center of New Media. He's the author of Local Code, uh, 3,659 Proposals about Data Design in the Nature of Cities. And I believe, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but my next book is entitled Rebel Plans, Apple, Star Wars, and Architecture at Bay. We're going to hear a lot more about what that means in a minute. Okay, so first, um, thank you, Alison. Okay, so, how's that? Is that right? 
Um, so I'm going to start with the model, the 1938-1940 model, which is exhibited a piece of it upstairs and in the uh, branches. And I think that that model, we look at it today, it was cleaned up this summer after it was discovered, and it, 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 it just reeks of its historical moment. The colors, the shapes, you see that, you know, what the city actually looked like in 1938. Um, but I think that it, it also captures for us a moment when master planning and city planning was ab about to, uh, to capture so many people's imagination. And that came in a really concrete form. For example, the invention of city planning departments, something we might think have always been around, but they haven't. They didn't really take root until after World War II. So you see in this late 1930s vision, the idea that you could build the whole city and lay it out in front of you and then use that model to think, which is what architects and landscape architects and urban planners and designers said, is that those models were tools for urban design. Um, but I also think that it, when we go back to the late 1930s, and I recommend, uh, the, the, it's on YouTube now, there's this wonderful 1939 film called The City that was played at the World's Fair in, in 1939 in New York City. And you can see that in the late 1930s, a lot of the ideas that we imagine cities with today were in existence at that point. So questions like um, large-scale redevelopment, which is where these big models come in, um, urban renewal, historic preservation, garden cities, which were look kind of like suburbs, like the idea of bringing nature into uh, daily life. And so I think the provocation that I would throw out for us today is that in many ways, we're, even though that model, when you go look at it, seems so dated and so old, I mean, after all, skyscrapers were an invention of the late 19th century, and we're still talking about them. Um, it, it looks very dated, but I think that we are still in that era. And I, uh, to me, that is a question in terms of like, something that a historian actually can help us with. That we're in, and this is where, to me, looking closely, I mostly focus on the 1950s, 1960s, and 1970s, um, the history of urban design and urban planning in San Francisco. That's what my book is about. Um, and I think that we, when we look at San Francisco's history, we can see that the themes that we usually use when we think about redevelopment and we think about the future of the city are drawn from models that are based on New York City. So many people have heard of Robert Moses or Jane Jacobs. Jane Jacobs' book came out in 1961. And this is a book that we're still talking about today. And it was rooted in her thinking about Greenwich Village and thinking about New York City and a kind of reaction against the destructive urban renewal model of Robert Moses. So I think when we look at San Francisco's history um, and you see a different set of issues, I mean, certainly you see preservation and you see redevelopment, but um, Dina asked us to also just say a word or two about the people that uh, like have emerged for us, like who are the people that surprised us in our in our own work? And for me, in the San Francisco story, um, it's not just the architects and the landscape architects and the planners who and the developers who lead with these, like envisioning the future, but it's also a lot of the allied artistic fields, like the architectural model makers who were front and center in those urban design tools, and they worked with the architects. Um, Women like um, uh, Virginia Green and Lila Johnston, who founded the premier architectural firm on the West Coast um, in 1951. They created that business together. Uh, publicists like Marion Conrad, who made the careers of real estate um, uh, people, landscape architects. She advocated for a lot of the uh, developments that got built. Um, and then a whole host of lawyers that brought lawsuits, lawsuits that no one ever brought in New York. Lawsuits, for example, in the late 1960s and the early 70s uh, that um, these like nonprofit 
uh, environmental and um, urban groups that said that you should not close and sell city streets to developers. Those were called the street vacation lawsuits, and that's not like a vacation that you take, but rather the idea that you can, um, you know, that you can close a public street and vacate its use and then sell it to a developer. So there were a whole host of these lawsuits in San Francisco did not ever come up in New York. So to me, I guess I would uh, uh, just conclude with the, the last thoughts that some of those battles over the public stewardship of land, um, of battles over public land, are much, much more evident when you follow these stories in the Bay Area. Um, uh, they're obviously prevalent in other cities, but they're very prevalent in San Francisco. And that's where, if you set aside Jane Jacobs and Robert Moses, you can see that the issues in redevelopment and preservation played out in a very different way. I think secondarily is the gender story that you know many of the people that I described in the allied arts professions, model making, you know, publicity, property management, graphic design, uh, people like Bobby Stauffacher who were deeply involved in you know urban planning, um, and her her work is also now at uh, in the Sea Ranch exhibit um, at SF MoMA. Um, uh, there were there were women everywhere in these fields in the 50s and 60s. So uh, so it makes like a lot of people talk about Jane Jacobs like she was so unusual as a woman, um, but she, in this field in the 1950s and 60s. But actually, uh, she turned down the opportunity to be on the uh, jury for the Golden Gateway redevelopment project in 1960 uh, because she didn't believe in urban renewal. So she she wasn't going to um, you know play a role in in picking a great project basically for a site when she didn't believe in urban renewal. But uh, I would say she would have felt very much at home in San Francisco where there were women in all of these fields. Um, so just a kind of a, a plug. She did. Jane Jacobs said that um, the field of urban planning in 1961. She said it hadn't changed very much since 1939. And I would say that we're now in a place where, from the if you go to the planning schools and the design schools, that still that um, juxtaposition of urban renewal preservation uh, is something that you know we can uh, you know we can move beyond. Yeah. I think this one works. Uh, yeah, I'd like to talk a little bit about just some of the difficulties and ambiguities that have run the people that have dreamed big about the future of San Francisco have run into from the beginning. And I think one of the reasons that they've run into problems is simply the terrain of San Francisco is so magnificent. Uh, this is the opposite of a tabula rasa city where you're just sitting on a plane and whatever the man-made environment's going to be, you can dream it up and live it up. Because if you take that approach to San Francisco, you're going to end up blocking the hills and blocking the bay and, um, and you know, defacing or obscuring a lot of what actually makes this place so spectacular. And, you know, the most famous and really complex and ambiguous visionary plan for San Francisco was the Daniel Burnham plan. Um, Daniel Burnham was the most famous planner, uh, you know, grand visionary architect of his time. He built the famous White City in the 1893 Columbian Exposition in Chicago. So this is Beaux-Arts style architecture, which has this whole principle of moral uplift and that the masses, including the struggling proletarian masses, will be lifted up by this, uh, by this magnificent classical architecture and it'll become more like Athens than the Lower East Side. And, you know, I'm not trying to completely mock it. There are some many amazing, beautiful buildings and, and, uh, and designs that came out of this. Uh, but he came up with this astonishingly ambitious plan for San Francisco. And the Board of Supervisors greeted it rapturously in April 1906. And they uh, 3,000 copies of this wonderful uh, Burnham plan were all printed up. 
and put in the city hall, which had been shoddily and corruptly constructed. And when the earthquake hit on April 18, 1906, the city hall collapsed, and almost all of his plans were buried. And nonetheless, the city was destroyed, of course, by most, almost all the city was destroyed by earthquake and fire. This should have been the tabula rasa for Burnham's plan to be implemented because everything was destroyed. But the city fathers, the newspaper, most of the business owners did not want to embark upon this hugely ambitious project, which would have meant, and they didn't have eminent domain back then. It would have been extremely difficult to have done this. Uh, in a nutshell, Burnham's plan was characterized by the city planner of San Francisco in 1973 as Paris with hills. So that this was a grand imperial city with Ron Ponce, with you know, round turnarounds like the Arc de Triomphe, the Eiffel Tower, huge ceremonial boulevards, an enormous peripheral road that would run all the way around the outskirts of the city. There were some amazing visionary things. There was going to be an enormous park that would run all the way from Lake Merced to Twin Peaks. And on top of Twin Peaks would be a huge statue representing the spirit of San Francisco. And it was supposed to be something like the poesile of the Villa of Hadrian or something, whatever a poesile is. That's actually the description. And, and there were all these various temples. Then there was going to be contoured streets instead of our grid streets. Um, so this all was this incredible vision. Some of it was implemented. Very little of it was implemented. The Civic Center that we have today is a reflection of Burnham's City Beautiful plan. It's somewhat successful, I would say, but the problem is with cars, and it's not like Washington, D.C., the, the glories of all those uh, Beaux-Arts buildings. Yeah, they kind of work as, a harm in, as an ensemble, but not entirely. There's a few other things, like Park Presidio Boulevard is another remnant of the Burnham plan. But in general, most of it wasn't built. And I think that in general, that was probably good. Um, I think that his plan would have been extremely uh, strange and weird and overly idealistic. And, and, and for a lot, you know, some of it was simply impractical. So, but not, not, not entirely not good. He had a lot of great ideas. One-way streets, uh, that was an idea way ahead of its time. And he even had an idea for shared backyards, which for, was first implemented, I think, in New York nice. later. But this is a very visionary idea where you're in have fences, and, that, and four people all have a yard. You can have some sunny side or something, and you probably know where it was. It's a development where they, they, they first implemented this. So a lot of the visionary things were good. But... In general, this, you know, he had this famous dictum, make no little plans. They have no power to stir the imagination. And in fact, some of this big thinking would have swallowed up the city. And even the contoured streets, I'm not sure would have been a good idea. Even though they, you know, we have them in Forest Hill and certain areas, but they would have been far less dramatic than the, than the grid system. So that's one example of thinking big and how it, the ambiguous aspects of that. But then, but uh, no, what Allison was referring to, urban renewal is the other classic case of thinking big. This is planning the model that came out, which is this very sort of Aristotelian, almost like psychotically obsessive. We're going to capture exactly what the city looked like in every detail. But there were people thinking much more platonically about the city, and it almost seems to me it was like a creature of World War II strategic bombing. You know, like, we, we wiped out the German cities, we'll wipe out these blighted areas. You know, nobody knew that if you wiped out the blighted areas without any planning for rehousing their residents, you would end up with far worse situations than you had before. So that urban renewal, generally speaking, in San Francisco was a debacle. Um, the Western edition is widely considered like the great sin of San Francisco's modern, uh, modern political policy. And then there were the freeways. They went, the freeways went along with the uh, urban renewal. This was another, uh, I, if, oddly enough, in that facsimile edition I have of the Burnham plan, the forward, by the planning de, de, uh, chairman, of uh, the head of the planning commission of San Francisco, James McCarthy, wrote, well, when the 1960s freeway phobia has passed, 
we will be able to think about circulation needs in a rational manner. It was basically completely condescending, like you fools, because there was a huge citizens' revolt um, that, that stopped most of the freeways that were planned, and the freeways that were planned were grotesque. They were going to put freeways under Glen Canyon. There was going to be an eight-lane freeway proposed to go under Russian Hill. There was an enormous freeway that would have gone up the Panhandle, and another one out in the western part of the city, and this was all but they're all very, uh, and the Embarcadero Freeway, with the hated Embarcadero Freeway, was supposed to connect up with the Golden Gate Bridge. So all of this was very rational, big planning, big visions, the same as the big visions of, of uh, you know, supportive ha of, of affordable housing in 30-story units in the Western Edition, and all of those big ideas came crashing down, and I'll just close with the, there's actually kind of a tragic or an unfortunate element of this. I read a line from somebody in, of SPUR, which is a local uh, planning organization that actually evolved out of an earlier organization, and they, one of, somebody wrote, you know, it's really a shame what happened with the Western Edition debacle, because that gave planning a bad name that it can never recover from or it's very hard to recover the prestige that planning had in it partly was cultural, you know, the white man and his suit and the engineer, they knew all and they were going to solve all the problems. Some of that was cultural and a creature of its time, but some of it was these specific failures of these, uh, of these planning visions, and that's unfortunate because I think planning at its best it preserves the hills, it preserves the, preserves the natural beauty while also allowing circulations. That, that's what planners do. They're, they're not supposed to just come in and impose you know, alien ideologies and big visions that screw up the landscape. They're actually supposed to work with it. And that's the Jane Jacobs model. Jane Jacobs obviously was extreme because she, if she didn't want the Golden Gateway, and I think the Golden Gateway is pretty much a failure in many ways, it doesn't really work. But at something, they were the old produce market, which is fantastic. It was in Thieves Highway. It was like I, Italian were bargaining over tomatoes in the heart of downtown. But it was completely run down. Like it was not going to stay there forever. There was no that doesn't happen in cities. You know, it's like Les All in Paris. So something was going to go in there, and you know, I think what went in there was not great. So I think maybe Jane Jacobs should have applied, and you know, and come up with a better plan. Uh, so I think that there is a room for visionary thinking and there's a room for planning and it, you know, it's received a lot of setbacks because of some of the failures and some ways of thinking too big and too abstractly. Great, that's a uh, very tough acts to follow from both of you two. Um, I think, um, uh, you know, hilariously enough, I think one of the only uh, segments of Death and Life um, in which Jacobs talks about a city other than New York is a takedown of the um, of Civic Center. Oh, right. Uh, oh, yeah, but, right, uh, right, right, right. Uh, and it's it's overly big. Uh, right, it's uh, too massive big, and blown, yeah, and yeah. Yeah. Right. Um, but I, I'm going to talk about, about models and uh, as well, and the, the history of models, and the history of models as a way to think about tomorrow, but in a different way from um, my, my two colleagues here tonight. Uh, I would also uh, go back to the, the WPA model um, uh, that you can um, uh, go and see after this uh, panel or a piece of it in person, but I would go into uh, another um, strange segment of the history of that model and uh, uh, the role that it played or the intersection it had with a very s another very specific way of thinking about tomorrow through models, both literally in the field of city planning and then further afield in the realm of science fiction. So before uh, uh, that model um, was, was uh, graciously and wonderfully resuscitated by uh, SF MoMA, it actually uh, lived, or a good portion of it lived, in the building where I work on the Berkeley campus, um, Worcester Hall, in uh, what was known for many years as the Environmental Simulation Laboratory. Um, and the Environmental Simulation Laboratory, um, it, it, the model sat under a gantry uh, with a camera on it that you could uh, steer around the, uh, uh, the portion of downtown of the city and generations of underpaid architecture students had uh, actually updated portions of the model to fit uh, Market Street as it developed um, at least all the way into the 1990s when more um, digitally based forms of urban simulation took over. 
that model of the, uh, the WPA model of San Francisco replaced another model in the history of that lab, an even stranger model, which is a one inch to 30 foot model of all of Marin County. Um, uh, about the, uh, it's about 100 meters long and, and uh, uh, immaculately built like a, a model railroad model with little fluffy grass and uh, 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 street signs and, um, uh, and, and, and all the rest. And that model uh, was built from scratch by an urban planner named uh, Donald Appleyard. And Donald Appleyard built it based on a project that he had done um, uh, with another planner from Boston, Kevin Lynch, who was actually one of three writers funded by the Rockefeller Foundation in their great urban project, along with Jane Jacobs. Um, not for, for another book of his, The Image of the City, but his follow-up to that, written with Donald Appleyard, was all about the future of the city through the automobile windshield. Uh, and uh, it was called The View from the Road, and one of the points that it was endlessly fascinated by in this very geeky, futurist way was the new way of encountering the city through the car windshield, very much in the spirit of the, uh, uh, of the urban redevelopers of the day, seeing the city as an object at speed, consuming it um, at speed with only a, a steering wheel to, uh, uh, to hold on to. And the object of fascin particular fascination to Donald Appleyard, the Berkeley City, Plan city Planner, and Kevin Lynch's MIT colleague, was the fact that when you're walking around the city, you move, and your body moves, and your head moves, and you have a whole haptic experience. But when you're driving through the city, now of course we have plenty of time to look around because we're stuck in traffic, <laughs> but at the time, they imagined that we would have to have a whole new kind of planning uh, for the visual field of the city because you were moving very quickly, of course, in their imaginings, and your uh, the car windshield was in front of you like a movie screen, but when you turned a corner, your head turned and you looked out the side of the car, and then you turned the, uh, uh, the steering wheel and the windshield slowly came around to match your optical field of vision. So in their mind, it was a totally different way of seeing the city. And they, it being the 1960s, and uh, there was a lot of defunding of um, uh, defense initiatives, and this, some of this money was going into urban design and planning. A large grant was given to Donald Appleyard at UC Berkeley to study the visual field from the automobile and its role in the design and planning of Marin County, just over the Golden Gate Bridge. And so this model was built, and a huge uh, robotically controlled, very early robotically controlled gantry was built with a, a, a digital mini computer. And it had no visual interface, but what you did was you steered this little model, uh, steered this gantry through the model with a joystick, just as was later done with the WPA model. And then you uh, rotated a dial to pivot the little model scope at the end of the model to match the field of view, so you could simulate this act of driving. And uh, then the, you did this you know, at, at pretty much full speed, and then the computer memorized that trajectory. And then it slowly um, uh, took uh, photographs of that trajectory uh, through the model scope onto uh, frames of a 16 millimeter film. And this was an incredibly slow process. Because of the tiny little prism and periscope that was used, it took 25 seconds to expose one frame of a 16 millimeter film. So producing just a few minutes of video would take days and weeks of 25 second exposures, one after the other, with the, with the computer allowing the small, consistent movements that, that were involved. Why am I telling you this? Well, Donald Appleyard tragically died um, uh, uh, in Athens of all places. Um, the, uh, the funding dried up for this study. It was later resuscitated, the WPA model was put, but the main technician um, who had developed this technique named John Dykstra, returned to Los Angeles where he happened to run into George Lucas at a party. Uh, and through this connection, the uh, technique, which was later called Dykstra Vision, that had been developed by Appleyard to, do, to study automotive planning in the Bay Area, was used for all the model photography in the first and subsequent Star Wars films. So that very special and spectacular feeling you have on an X-Wing fighter is precisely a camera that's able to move around through models that are being photographed and, and in a way that replicates the feeling of vision versus just going, uh, going through the standard trajectory. How does this relate to the city today? 
I think it does. This is part of what I'm trying to write about in this book. Um, there's a couple more interesting uh, uh, moments to this history. Star Wars, of course, is a very Bay Area story. It was based uh, very much on um, uh, George Lucas's own experience of hot rod culture in Modesto. Uh, the name he gave to the film's hero, Skywalker, which had to be changed <laughs> from Star Killer thanks to the Manson murders and their revival in the history uh, uh, in pop culture in the 70s. Uh, the name Skywalker was the only name he didn't make up. He took it from his grandfather's tales of the building of the Golden Gate Bridge uh, and the name that was given to the ironworkers that, were, um, uh, that went over its trajectory. So it's a, it's a very Bay Area story. But, uh, and it involves um, a conflict between a, a, a small, uh, a community organized uh, rebel alliance that uh, stands for traditional values and old ways of doing things against um, uh, not just an evil empire, but an e evil empire that builds enormous buildings like the Death Star. You know, the size of the moon, uh, uh, that have to be assaulted and, uh, uh, and have, of course, fatal flaws. Um, uh, always, and um, uh, and this is a very, and the aesthetics of the two are also very revealing about the uh, Bay Area design culture and the, the kind of uh, uh, nightmare vision of this perfectly coherent world that the uh, that the Empire represents versus the much more ragtag um, Millennium Falcon, who's the you know a bucket of bolts, but also the fastest ship in the galaxy. It's interesting to think about today, um, of course. Lucas's, uh, um, uh, George Lucas, as much as he was a futurist and filmmaker, built himself a classic Victorian um, uh, in Skywalker Ranch. Uh, his wife, Marsha Lucas, who supported most of his efforts, uh, actually divorced him for the stained glass artist of the Victorian uh, <laughs> ceiling in Skywalker Ranch's library. And as a result of that, he had to sell uh, uh, the digital division of Lucasfilm to Steve Jobs, where it became Pixar. Um, Steve Jobs, of course, um, uh, another very important Bay Area technological figure, until um, uh, very late in his life, was only ever a consumer of classic Bay Area Victorian design. His famous photograph of him only with a Tiffany lamp and a high-end stereo. Um, but then, um, uh, later on, uh, in the contemporary landscape of the Bay Area, we are starting to see a very different strain um, uh, of, of urbanism. Uh, Alison has talked about this before in her um, uh, uh, very um, compelling stories of how San Francisco decided in one generation to develop in one way and has decided in the current um, generation to develop in a very different way. Um, I'm not the only one to make this connection. Um, uh, Apple's new headquarters was uh, almost universally compared to the Death Star when it was first unveiled. Um, <laughs> Uh, the Salesforce Tower as well. Uh, these very large, very uh, uh, slick, uh, um, coherent um, buildings that are distinctly different from the urbanism that San Francisco has, uh, has had over time. And they also reflect a new urban landscape in which the kinds of uh, uh, misfits and uh, uh, intolerance that has characterized San Francisco, I would argue, have also to some extent receded. Um, uh, and just to connect this back to Star Wars, my, um, uh, my uh, aid memoir for my 11-year-old son on why you always have to be nice to everybody is Yoda in Star Wars, who seems like the most incoherent, homeless, tiny gremlin until he turns out to be the most powerful Jedi in the universe. This is a very urban moment. You don't know who you're going to meet, and there's a level of mutual respect and tolerance that any urban society depends on. Uh, and then, you know, after all, uh, the only thing you can say for sure about a Death Star is that it suddenly explodes at the end of the movie. So uh, that's where I'll leave it, and thank you very much. Thanks all three of you. I, I think, well, um, so many things come up for me, um, and I'm sort of thinking about a couple of connections between your remarks, and um, I suppose many, many of the thoughts that I was having have to do with questions around power, um, and sort of the way that power is distributed. Um, and, you know, I, th I think it kind of, you know, you bring it up in, in each case, and I think we'll, we'll come back to, to thinking about um, sort of alternatives to this top-down vision in a minute, but, but first I, I, I want to ask you a question, because all of you kind of talked about a little bit about aesthetics, 
and the relationship between the um, a particular set of aesthetics and um, and and what that ideal sort of vision would would be of a public or of, of what the city was supposed to represent, what it was supposed to do. And I'd love to dig into that a little bit more. Alison, you spoke here in the library a few days ago, um, and you were talking about the the, the plans for the produce market. For, for that particular site and the role of the models themselves and the aesthetics of the, the objects of the model and how that um, changed people's perception. Um, so I'd be interested for you to just uh, talk a little bit about that, but also anything else you'd like to say about that, the role of aesthetics in thinking about what these ideals are. Okay, I think that does get to the really big question of like, where do new ideas come from? You know, I think in the biggest sense, that's in many ways what we are each addressing you know, whether it's from the, the planner Burnham, um, whether we can trace this amazing kind of technological intellectual route as you just did. Um, so I think that one of the, you know, one of the uh, contradictions that we sometimes have if we look at, for example, the, um, you know, the ferment in the 1960s where you know, the, the, the people are dealing with a new kind of aesthetics. It's, and it is all about scale, right? I mean, you had tall buildings before the Depression. You had like a 30-story building in San Francisco would have been the tallest in the 1920s as compared with New York City where you're looking at like 100 stories. Um, so, you know, so San Francisco is dealing in the post-war period with um, this, the, all the aesthetic questions of large scale. Uh, sometimes that was just like a modern hospital building. It didn't have to be a huge urban renewal clearance. Um, maybe it was like a huge golf course or a shopping mall, you know, but, but like the region was just percolating with these large scale things. And so um, who's, whose ideas are those? Like how are they implemented? Um, and I think, you know, part of the, um, you know, the, the debate is that it's it's not exclusively from the the people who are credited as the architects or the landscape architects or the planners, and that's where I think the model making story you're you're um, pointing to comes from. So it, that model making company that I described, uh, very small. I mean, that's a lot of these businesses were like you know people's basements. It started and then it grew a little bit. Never became super famous. Maybe thirty employees, but. Um, when you think about it, an architect has an idea for like a huge complex, like Golden Gateway, but nobody's ever seen it. Even the architect doesn't know what it looks like. And so you have to put that idea out there, and in a lot of these projects, you have, the public has to be convinced. So if a skyscraper, like when the Barcadero Center was designed, um, the, the height limit of the waterfront was 25 stories. So if they wanted 45 stories or 60 stories, which is what they were asking for, they had to like buy, they had to convince people, they had to get the, you know, the equivalent that had to be approved. It couldn't just happen because the architect thought it was a good design idea. So that's where these kind of like other, um, there are so many other avenues for input, I guess, and in this case, like the, just to single out, because it's such a short, conversation here, but those model makers were the ones who looked at blueprints and literally showed the architects like what their ideas were. And it was based on those designs, who was going to get that 18 acre incredibly valuable parcel, the land, like the land was the thing. And it was based on that design, and it was the model makers that had to kind of convince you like, especially in this era with modern buildings and skyscrapers intersecting with old city, like who got to show you what that was gonna look like? Were you gonna tear down all the old buildings in Jackson Square to make way for the Transamerica Pyramid? You know, what was gonna happen when the Transamerica Pyramid met on the ground with Jackson Square? Yeah. So those are the kinds of things that like had to be actually hashed out at, at some level. I think that the aesthetic question is, uh, it, 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 there's, a, there's a fascinating comparison between the Golden Gateway that we're talking about, which is that area, for those of you that don't know it, 
Um, there's a bunch of high-rise, uh, expensive residential towers, and then there's a bunch of office buildings, several of which have these very dramatic raised squares. And um, the architectural historian Sally Woodbridge, in her analysis of it, I think rightfully said that they don't completely work because all of the big garage walls create these big blank facades that kill what they call, you know, activating the street. That's a term of art in, in urbanism. You want active streets. There's these, you don't want big facades. The absolute worst case of this aesthetically planning everywhere, it, probably in the world, and it's getting better now, is Mission Bay, which is an absolute disgrace. Um, and, and Golden Gateway's a little bit like that. Once you get up into those raised areas, they're actually kind of mind-blowing because you can like look up to Knob Hill, but they have these drab little staircases that go up them. You don't even, most people don't even go up to those areas. So I don't think it's completely successful. But another example, this is another huge top-down, big, multi-billion dollar modern development that actually works magnificently if they ever reopen it, is the new transit center. I don't know if anyone got to go up there before, unfortunately, they discovered that it might collapse but it's really amazing. It's like the high line meets, you know, some crazy futuristic urban park where you can do yoga and get drinks and hang out and people are getting high. It's like, it's, it's um, and old buildings are visible. Um, it's really fantastic. So to me, that was an example of how even in a very heavily planned gazillion dollar, uh, deeply, very densely urban, um, set up, you can have a really, a, a really great aesthetic outcome. But I think you know the, this city is probably the, what the, I think. I'll just quickly say this. I was just on a panel downstairs about housing, and I think right now you mentioned the uh, the Salesforce Tower, which is a real Rorschach test for people. And you know whether it's you know they used to call Coit Tower a Fleischhacker's last erection. <laughs> and, uh, and I've heard similar jokes, there's many, many jokes about Benioff's mighty erection. And many, many of those jokes are not made with a smile. They're made with like rage at this huge phallus raping the city and representing everything terrible about what's happening. And you know, maybe, I, I actually don't hate it because it's, I think it's an unusual shape. It's kind of cool that way, it's monstrous for sure. But in some ways I feel like that battle a little bit got lost South of America already. Like even, you know, by the time we passed Proposition M and put height limits in and had the downtown plan in 78, there was already so much profanation and the old pre-war sky, you know, the landscape was already gone. But I think what we're looking at now going forward aesthetically is how do we deal with issues like housing? You know, we have these skyscrapers are generating all this money and bringing people into the city and now we have to build housing. Well, if we build housing, if we upzone, which another term of art means you increase the, um, the height limitations on zoning, if you're probably, you know, some buildings will be ugly, some won't be. You're going to change the cityscape to some degree. If you do it out in the Richmond or the Sunset, you won't change it as much. But it's going to aesthetically have some consequences. But it's an ethical issue now because people can't move and live in this city so that there's a real collision of the traditional aesthetic uh, defense of the magnificent old San Francisco, but a lot of times that position is being held by people that rightfully or wrongfully are accused of being NIMBYs, of people that like just want to not build because it's in their back, beautiful backyard. So I think that the aesthetic issue, and I believe me, I'm deeply sensitive to it, but I think it's, you know, it's got to be seen in a context of, of democracy and housing and it's becoming increasingly tricky. You can't just say, well, we must preserve every single view that there is in San Francisco, because I, I don't think that will work anymore in the future. I mean, yeah, density is about power, and it's possible to get a, a density of offices because of the power of the people who build them. It's hard to get a density of affordable housing because of the lack of power of the people who need it. Um, uh, the, I think that the, uh, and we need both. Uh, I would very quickly, 
just tell one story about aesthetics because um, I can't resist. Because I, one of I love um, uh, Allison's book generally is an amazing document of a very important time in San Francisco. But I love the story of the model builders most of all. Um, so I, I just wanted to talk, tell a, a little bit of uh, a story about um, one of my favorite pieces as an architect about the story I was telling, which are all the techniques from architectural model building um, and urban simulation, all the aesthetic and literal techniques that made their way through Star Wars into the sci-fi universe. Because when John Dykstra was hired um, uh, to, to work on the Star Wars films, he brought with him a host of Berkeley uh, architecture students and other people who had worked in the urban simulation lab. And, and two very simple things uh, that happened. Um, one is that the, the, they actually adapted all these techniques from urban simulation and architectural model building to make things like the Death Star. So if you look at the surface of the Death Star, it has all these infinite variety of panels and surfaces that are actually only six <coughs> panels that were rotated in a casting bed uh, and moved around in different ways to make this kind of seemingly infinite um, surface. And then an even more hilarious one was shared with me by the um, former island model maker, um, uh, Adam Savage, which is that uh, apparently until uh, the architecture students hit uh, Industrial Light and Magic, uh, all Hollywood model making was done with five minute epoxy. And the architecture students, of course, had discovered Crazy Glue and Zappa Gap, which could put together models instantly. Um, uh, and that also not only led to a revolution in model making, it led to the aesthetics of the Star Wars films of adding all of these extra bits and regals, they were called, uh, that, that gave a kind of uh, dense, complex service because you could do it all very quickly. Um, the last thing I'll, I'll leave with is a uh, 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 the, the thing I actually found most haunting in digging into it, which was the, the relates a little bit to the current debate about San Francisco and its ethics and aesthetics that we're having. <coughs> the, um, the model builders who were, um, we, we grew up, or I certainly grew up, with this idea of the Rebel Alliance and the, and the Empire as two fundamentally separate, you know, and antithetical entities uh, representing entirely different worldviews. But if you dig under the hood of the aesthetics, uh, the story that was tell, told to the model builders is that they're very, very similar. They just represent a slight divergence at one point in history, and, and then they ultimately come to different aesthetic goals. But you should recognize parts in one from the other. So when you're building a rebel ship, and building an empire ship, you should be going from the same parts bin, but just assembling them slightly differently to, to, to add a little bit more diversity a little less diverse, a little more coherence to, to the other. And so I think that's an interesting um, uh, story to bring back to this moment that we're trying to think about, not just in, in San Francisco, in my city of Oakland, and the Bay Area as a whole. Part of it involves thinking as a whole Bay Area about the, uh, uh, the aesthetics and the ethics of the city that we want to live with and its differences from the city in which we find ourselves today. Thank you. So. Just to key off that last, that point, um, thinking of how we want to talk about and think collectively around, um, you know, what we want our cities to be, um, that that's exactly what the Take Part project with the WP model is all about. Um, and as um, Alison mentioned, so immediately after this talk, um, uh, there will be. Um, there actually will be three tours of the, the pieces of the model that are here at, the, at this library. So um, currently, pieces of the model are on view at every branch of the San Francisco Public Library until the end of March, till March 25th. And if you're interested, so the sixth floor isn't open tonight, but there are special tours of the model if you want to see it, in conversations with um, Christina Moretto, the photo curator here at the library, as well as uh, Stella Lockman, who's the project manager for Take Part. You can meet, there's a sign um, on the opposite wall of that room which says, check this out. You can meet there at 10, at 10.30 and 11. There's Christina, who's just waving. Um, so if you were interested in going up and having a conversation about the, this downtown area um, and, uh, and want to see the model and learn more about its history and how it got here, um, please um, do meet 10, 10.30 and 11 at Check This Out Designer. Not just the designers and the dreams of designers, but the ways in which designers um, allow themselves to be complicit with uh, those who made money off of urban renewal. Urban renewal was an enormous get-rich-quick scheme for developers who got land for free from, the, uh, uh, from its expropriation, from the people who lived there, and were able to flip it and make an enormous amount of uh, money. And that's why so much of it happened. That's why so much of it happened in New York, where there was so much uh, uh, development money. Um, and so development looks different now, but the, the sort of dance between developers, communities, and 
cities that want the, to uh, allow good things to be built, uh, allow density to happen, allow the life of cities to be renewed as it does need to be with a small r, but to not allow the, uh, uh, the kind of complicity of, um, uh, of, of public visions in the expropriation of, of uh, uh, land vitality from the public sphere. That's the battle of, of city planning today as well. Why don't we build public housing? We have some. Why, why, don't, we, why don't we build it? <laughs> More? Yeah, I mean, we have had a we have some. complete collapse at the national level of any commitment to housing. Um, you know, there might, the, the National Housing Act of 48 actually said every American deserves a house and a decent environment. There, I mean, it seems incredible that the federal government was actually <coughs> making noises that sounded like social housing in Europe, which is what we should have. But it ultimately goes to the federal government. You know, you take a city like San Francisco, we actually throw large amounts of money for subsidized housing, mostly for very poor people. We don't throw very much money at subsidized housing for middle class people. Because if you open that door, I mean, you know, now it's cost five hundred to eight hundred thousand dollars to build one unit of housing. So that that's one of the reasons that we don't build that much. Where's that money gonna come from? So it's set mostly built by set asides. And that's the dance with the developers that Nicholas just referred to. Every single deal cut in San Francisco with a developer the city is extracting a pound of flesh for affordable housing from that development. And it's a negotiation, and it's international capital, and they can go elsewhere. So it's, it's, it's an interesting dance, but that's how, mostly how it gets built, is by that mechanism. Thank you. Thank you all so much. I wish we had more time for questions. If the three of you are willing, perhaps you could stick around a little bit and talk to folk outside, but I want to make sure that we turn over the room. So please join me in thanking um, Alison for Thank you. Thank you. We're saying that the rise and fall of images of the future that were held in art and poetry and music uh, precedes or accompanies the rise and fall of cultures. So as long as a society's image is positive, and flourishing, the flower of culture is in full bloom. Once the image begins to decay and loses vitality, however, the culture does not long survive. So it's a precursor. So the images of the future that we hold, the kind of draw to the future, or lack thereof, is a kind of precursor or, or, or indicative step uh, whether that culture is, is thriving or not. And I think we can pass our own judgments about what we've heard and hear in this country, in this city, uh, and what we might need to do about it to intervene. And on the city level, I mean, this, this is, we're talking about civic imagination. Um, you know, uh, Bruce Katz wrote a book called The New Localism, and he says there's been a de facto memo, memo sent out by national government in most states to cities and counties that you are in charge of the future. So, you know, it's been said many times, but cities, city leaders, that's where the leadership's going to come from, right? There's a vacuum of f future visions and leadership at the national level, for, for sure. So, if it's going to happen here, we better get better at futures thinking, and we can. So one thing about futures thinking is that we, we do think about the past, and I love these kinds of images. This is a, a relative uh, uh, amount of time, so if you actually start up here at your shoulder, of all of uh, uh, world history, or, or um, history of the universe, uh, basically the human part, where we live to now, is like the sliver at the end of your fingertip, or fingernail. Right, so just a little perspective. We've done. Uh, there's a lot of stuff happening in a very short period of time. So we need to contextualize that. We're part of a bigger story. Another key concept in future studies is that there is not in this invisible uh, motion graphic here. Uh, I can tell you whatever I want you to. But basically, there are many possible futures. There's not one future that we're trying to predict. It's not linear out in front of us. Uh, that we can see. We're, we look for a multitude of futures, and, and pluralizing futures is very important, and in creating that. And then what is, uh, what often we think of as impossible today becomes possible tomorrow. So living at the edge of possibility, creating that, experimenting with that, is our job. It's our job as researchers to look at it, but it's our, also our job as humans to invent it and create it. Another point that I think has come out very clearly here tonight is that we need to feel the future. The, the evocative uh, language of the poets really, I think, got to all of us. Um, you know, what was said in the last panel, 
I mean, using language to make us feel the future. If we don't have an emotional connection, if we don't feel it viscerally, it, it just sort of lays out there in an abstraction and we don't feel like we can act on it or it doesn't hit us at a gut level. If there's no emotional connection to our future's visions, it doesn't matter. We're not going to do anything about it, generally. So, um, you know, what we say, uh, why we try to create, why we try to imagine, actively do that, uh, is that it's better to be surprised by a simulation rather than blindsided by reality. So we need to pre-experience possible futures so we, that we can learn from those. Learn from those things that don't exist yet. And so it's a weird, sort of, not very... Uh, technically logical thing, but we have to actually pre-create futures to experience and then learn from that and then create better futures, hopefully. That's the big goal. So I'm going to pass it uh, to Dietmar. He's going to uh, talk about his work, uh, and then we're going to go into some uh, of the artifact creation. Thank you. Sure. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so basically, I uh, just want to make uh, three small points uh, that when we talk about you know, a civic imagination uh, is this term that was at the uh, basis of this panel. And, and I think uh, civic imagination is manifests itself often in very small, very humble things, such as repair and, and maintenance. Uh, it's not something that uh, comes out of the brain of one genius, but it's something that emerges in a collective uh, improvisational process. Um, and you know, I, I work uh, in garbage and uh, electricity systems and street lights and urban infrastructure topics. And uh, there I often see these presentations and uh, very neat system diagrams of, of smart city projects. Uh, but of course, in reality, no project uh, works like that. You know, there's always something that the planners didn't think about. and. Uh, there's always a way how people figure out how to use a system uh, different uh, than the designers have originally uh, intended. Uh, so yeah, I, I cannot now figure out how to click here, but let's see, yeah, okay. So um, I'm, one thing uh, I've been looking at uh, is uh, how smart city projects are currently uh, played, uh, deployed in the global south, you know, like here in San Francisco and in, uh, in Europe, uh, all of these IT companies have developed all these solutions uh, for uh, the Western context, but now they are uh, in India, there are 100 smart cities uh, planned in Indonesia and, and in the Philippines. And of course, this is a very different context, you know, they are, uh, they are not made for this context. And I'm curious, you know, how, uh, how these things actually play out and uh, I'm interested in these uh, um, topics of, you know, how things that don't work in the first place get repaired. So Manila um, is a in very interesting city. It has all these very fascinating, colorful, sculptural street lights. We counted on just a couple of blocks, over 26 different types of these cultural, uh, sculptural street lights. And um, they, it already shows you that it has a very different approach to infrastructure uh, than what, what we understand. And of course, you know, sometimes they don't work. And here we see an example of uh, a sculptural street lamp that didn't work anymore. And someone pulled out the wire and put it uh, to an uh, adjacent lamp that is much simpler. So this is the result of a effort by the local city council that uh, came up with solutions together with the uh, local residents uh, to fix uh, a problem that was not uh, yeah, uh, solved in time by the uh, authority. Uh, so we see that we have a, um, this kind of improvisational process of repair and bricolage is in a way a conversation through the material world. Yeah? So someone builds something, someone else adds something. Uh, and we see this in, in many different ways. And just by the way, you know, uh, talking about Manila, it sounds like again a very um, romantic view, Western-based view on a, a city of the global south uh, with uh, look, looking at informality, but we have the same thing in Boston. Uh, just when I came to the airport, uh, I, uh, 10 years ago, um, the city of Boston had a pro problem with street lamps in the tunnel where uh, over 9,000 uh, street lamps had to be fixed with cable ties. And 
Yeah, uh, because the company who made those lamps originally went out of business and the bolt started to corrode. And it was originally something for, for a year and then it was supposed to be replaced. And uh, when I uh, passed them uh, yesterday, I saw that they are still there. So uh, I think these kind of improvisational processes are not just ubiquitous, they are also in a way a necessity of how we create uh, collective uh, futures. Uh, and, and this also involves other civic activities, such as uh, public protest. Uh, two years ago, uh, with a couple of friends, I was in Boston at the Women's March, and uh, after the march, uh, the, uh, everyone dropped and basically arranged their posters uh, on, on the Boston Common, on this uh, fence that is in this uh, um, old graveyard. And it was a fascinating monument of uh, yeah of, 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 of civic imagination and we were wondering what is going to happen to these posters so uh, we asked city workers and they said they're going to throw everything away because it's a fire hazard and in fact they are starting with it right now and so we had to act very fast so we rented a van and uh, coordinated with people around us who got a team together to uh, collect all these posters <laughs> and uh, ended up collecting uh, all 6,000 of these posters and digitized them uh, to understand this, this collective process of, uh, yeah, of, of um, you know, how, how, how these, these, all these kind of different um, ideas and, and, and slogans uh, emerge. So, usually you capture just you know, a few highlights, uh, but never the, the total context of, of all, the, all the different posters. And uh, so if you go, uh, there's Art of the March of Boston, if you're interested. Uh, if you search for a term such as resist, you see uh, slogans that play with the word resist in all kinds of different ways. And uh, so you see uh, resist, uh, join the resistance, of course, uh, uh, Star Wars ref cultural references, uh, but also then plays like resistors and we are resistors. So you see, there is a, a, a kind of it's also also uh, like poetry in a certain way, and uh, this also extends to the governance of a city. Uh, in in the past ten years, almost every city now has created a, a three one one system. And because it's a, a place for us to have knowledge and learning. We don't just keep that to ourselves, we share that. That's called reciprocation, that's called the circle. So we're going to be talking about circles a little bit. And because we're the adults, I think most of the adults, or most of us are kind of, no, no, good, good, good. We're spirit, we're, we're physically adults, but we're spirited in all kinds of different ways. Excellent. So that means we have open minds and open hearts. So in honor of that, I wish to sing an honor song for the youth, for the youth and us, for the youth of our ancestors, for the youth that are here today, for the youth of the future, the young in us, the young before us, the young after us, that show us and teach us how to always be excited to learn. Sometimes we become adults and we get a little bit too, you know. So this song is for the youth. <laughs> 